It's a new day on Deep Space Nine, and Bashir's having a drink with plain, simple Garak at the Replimat. Bashir's dancing around the idea that he's a spy again, probably to distract himself from the yearning, but he does raise an interesting point about how the only cardigan on a Bajoran station manages to earn a living. Here's an odd thing, it looks like plain simple Garak has just stopped being the only one of his kind here. A youngster just arrived, and even more curiously, wearing a Bajoran earring and with a Bajoran escort. That's enough to make plain simple Garak go over and try to find out more, but the only thing he learns is that the kid has an excellent dentist. It appears our newcomer doesn't care for cardigans any more than the average visitor from Bajor, and his companion doesn't think much of plain simple Garak either. Bashir thinks this is worth mentioning in the staff meeting shortly after. Odo's surprised to learn we have another cardigan on board, which seems odd for someone usually so informed. Kira explains the kid in question was probably an orphan left behind when the cardigan scarpered and taken in by those willing to do so. That must be a very conflicted existence, but we've no time to think about it now, as Gul Dukat is on the phone and wants a word. He's heard about plain simple Garak gaining a full set of dental records on his hand, which is impressive when it literally just happened. He thinks the Bajorans have been teaching these orphans to hate their own kind, something he believes is proven by this attack and he intends to use this as evidence that leaving them was wrong, something he says he argued against at the time, and to bring them all home to Cardassia. We should probably have a word with the Bajoran, who says he's the kid's father. The boy, whose name is Rugal, was taken in by he and his wife when the cardigans buggered off and left him, which is probably why he's a tad sceptical about them giving a damn now. He's also very clear that he kept nothing from Rugal about the occupation of Bajor and what his people did here, though clarifies he considers the boy to be Bajoran and softens somewhat at the mention of him. If the truth made him numb on a guy's hand, well, maybe they shouldn't have been so shit. Rugal and his dad came here with another visitor, so maybe they can offer an impartial view of the whole thing. He's currently gambling in quarks and upsetting the owner by winning. Perhaps his good fortune is karmic balance for his head looking like the tip of a cock. He remembers Bashir from the altercation, though is disinclined to get involved with the whole thing. He eventually says he's known the father for a few months and helped him in his search for work. Then he goes on to say the boy lives in a constant nightmare of hatred and beatings, the target of Bajoran animosity for all the cardigans have done. The father denies all of this when it's brought to him. Sisko's non-committal and says we'll go through it all, but for now, he wants Rugal to stay with the O'Briens. Rugal thinks this is punishment and says he didn't do anything wrong. Personally, I'm on his side here as assuming somebody as fine with you touching them can go do one. Regardless, Sisko says he's not in any trouble and this will only take a couple of days to sort out. His dad tells him it's safe as humans, unlike cardigans, won't hurt him. Plain simple Garak is getting a checkup, and Bashir mentions how all of this may help Rugal get away from a potentially harmful situation, and mean Gul Dukat can do the same for other orphans too. When he's finished laughing, plain simple Garak explains why. The Cardigans didn't simply forget about all of these kids. Such an organised and precise military has no cracks for them to fall into. No, they were left here deliberately. And the guy in charge of that withdrawal? Why, that would be a certain Gul Dukat. Speaking of which, he's giving Sisko another call and thanking him for discovering the abuse of an orphan. Sisko's quick to correct him that what we have right now is just an accusation. We need more data to make the right choice for him, and part of that is knowing if he has any living biological relatives, so we send a DNA scan so they can do a science to it. Before Gul Dukat hangs up, Bashir jumps in with some questions. Dukat's a touch surprised by quite how much Bashir knows, most notably that the civilian authority Dukat's blaming for the whole thing doesn't have the power to issue direct orders to the military. Dukat doubles down on it without providing any real answer, sticking to his story about both not wanting to withdraw from Bajor and not wanting to leave the orphans before hanging up. Bashir thinks he's full of shit, but Sisko needs more to go on. That's why he wants to talk to plain simple Garak himself. O'Brien struggling to see Rugal as a kid rather than a cardigan. Somewhat understandable given his past, though Keiko makes it clear she has little patience for him projecting his biases onto a child. She's leaning into exploring his heritage and has replicated cardigan food to try. I'd maybe have asked him first myself what with this already being traumatic, but her heart's in the right place. And it gives Rugal and O'Brien something they agree on, so it's not a complete loss. 
He can't sleep later while O'Brien's still up, and they chat a little. Fair play here to O'Brien, he's the first person this whole episode to tell Rugal that his own opinion matters and he should make his wishes known. Rugal just wants to go home, not to Cardassia as O'Brien assumes, but back to Bajor where his parents are. A little probing from O'Brien has Rugal adamant that they've never once raised a hand to him, despite him being a filthy cardigan. Rugal's opinion of his own species is such that even O'Brien is forced to defend them and say you can't judge a whole people by the actions of part, even if that part did kill millions. Bashir's finally got what he wanted, plain simple Garak, in his bedroom. I mean, okay, he broke in and is dragging Bashir out of bed to visit Bajor, but that's the monkey's paw for you. It's important enough to go right now, so it's important enough to wake Sisko and ask for a mega shuttle. Bashir's there then when Sisko receives an urgent call from Gul Dukat. We've matched Rugal's DNA, and it turns out he's the son of a high ranking politician. What a fascinating coincidence. Rugal was believed killed in a Bajoran resistance attack. Obviously, the politician wants the lad back, and Dukat being told that's still up in the air leaves him confused. Sisko's still not sure what would be best for the kid, and the guy who made those accusations of physical abuse has mysteriously disappeared. We'll have to clear it up when the politician arrives, as he's on his way here now. It'd probably be wise if we can find out as much as we can, and as plain simple Garak seems to be more knowledgeable about all this than us, Sisko decides letting him go cruising with Bashir might be informative. Their destination is a resettlement centre, and a pair of kids leg it when they see a cardigan approaching. Bashir wants to take a look at some records, this being the place from which Rugal was apparently adopted. That's a little before her time, says the attendant, as she was busy in the underground fighting invaders, and thinks there'll be no records from that time. Plain simple Garak disagrees, his people are very good at keeping records, so if it happened on their watch, it'll be here. There's the added wrinkle of the computer not working, though plain simple Garak knows a thing or two about that and gets it running quickly enough. There's no record of Rugal or his adoption, though. It could be a misfiling, so plain simple Garak nabs the whole planet-wide database and sticks it on a USB drive to check at leisure back on the station. I wonder how big the fine would be for that GDPR violation. Before they can go, some kids appear. One, a cardigan girl, asks if they've come to take her and the others back to Cardassia. There's not enough inflection to decide whether she views that prospect as a good or bad thing, and plain simple Garak seems uncomfortable with the whole situation as he tells her no before leaving. The flight back seems a good time to look through the database, but Bashir cuts him off and demands to know what the bloody hell's going on. Plain simple Garak lays it out in plain simple terms. The evacuation of Bajor was ordered by the Cardigan civilian government. Gul Dukat vocally opposed this, not least of which because it meant losing his very prestigious position overseeing the occupation. A member of that same government, one Bashir surmises was involved in the decision, has now discovered, after the involvement of Dukat, that his dead son is significantly less dead than originally thought, and was abandoned there during the very evacuation he ordered and Dukat opposed. What a curious turn of events, and one that could lead to a very messy public embarrassment for one of Gul Dukat's personal political opponents. O'Brien's trying to explain to Rugal's biological father that things may not go quite the way he anticipates. He seems to not fully understand, or is just more concerned about having shamed himself for allowing it to happen. Rugal gives him somewhat less consideration and calls him a butcher. He also says the Bajorans killed the politician's son, meaning himself, for his crimes, which is probably enough to keep a psychiatrist busy for many, many years. Suffice to say, Rugal is very clear that he does not see this man as his father, and refuses to go to Cardassia with him. That means getting the courts involved, and by courts we mean Federation, or more specifically, Sisko. Rugal's two dads are both in agreement that he's suitable, the Cardigan variant content in knowing that he's a father too. It's a difficult enough situation to begin with, and Gul Dukat turning up unannounced certainly doesn't help matters. It does serve to make Sisko more convinced that there's more going on here than a simple custody battle, though, despite Dukat himself saying he's here purely to offer support, regardless of any former disagreement he and Rugal's biological father may have had in the past. Sounds like we need more data, which is handy as plain simple Garax found some. Well, that's a simplification. He's found none, but that's a clue in itself, as it means some bugger deleted it deliberately. 
The entry for Rugal may be gone, but we might still be able to learn something from the person who originally wrote it, and plain simple Garak has their name. We'll assume he did something clever, like cross-reference the time period and location with similar entries to find out who wrote those. Bashir's probably going to get a more positive reception, so he's the one to call. She remembers Rugal, as the whole thing was a bit odd. Most orphans at that time were picked up off the streets, but he was brought in by a cardigan who knew enough about him to pass on his name. And that cardigan was in a military uniform, one that was serving at a place called Terok Nor. The custody hearing is being held in the schoolroom, Quark presumably not willing to give up his bar to be a courtroom again now that we have a spare set. O'Brien's recounting how Rugal reacted to his biological father when Bashir and plain simple Garak arrive. Sisko agrees to let Bashir ask a few questions, and we learn that Rugal's discovery has yet to be made public knowledge. His biological dad admits it'll ruin him politically, which is curious timing as their government is about to look at some dodgy shit on Bajor and mention of a military coup, an investigation involving Gull Dukat, in fact. Ducat's not chuffed by how things are going, and he's even less pleased at how much Bashir has learned about Rugal's admission to the relocation centre, one made by a military officer who seemed to know exactly who he was, and one stationed at a place called Terok Nor, which is, of course, the cardigan name for Deep Space Nine, and the station over which Gull Ducat had command. The look he gives plain simple Garak as he leaves suggests he might be off Ducat's Christmas card list, but he's been snookered and knows there's not a thing he can do about it. All that's left is cleaning up the mess, and there's no right answer for that. The one Sisko goes with is allowing Rugal to be taken back to Cardassia. His biological father thanks Sisko for enabling him to save his career, and not, I note, for returning his son. He's also mealy-mouthed when Sisko asks about the other orphans on Bajor, and whether they'll be returned to Cardassia too. At least O'Brien's still paying attention to what Rugal wants, and says he'll arrange to make trips here possible whenever he'd like. Maybe that will give Rugal the chance to be a part of both families. Bashir still doesn't understand why plain simple Garrick went to all this trouble just to take a massive shite on Ducat. That's a mystery for another day, though, and we'll leave Bashir to think on the topic until the next adventure. You know, something in this didn't sit right with me when I watched it, and I couldn't quite put my finger on it. Rugal was treated well by his adoptive parents and brought up in their religion, their animosity never aimed at him directly and clearly given both love and support. It took a while for me to figure out what was likely obvious to others watching, and I suspect there's a quite simple reason for that. Rugal is a cardigan boy, and his Bajoran parents taught him to hate cardigans, but it's okay because he's an honorary Bajoran. Do you see the issue? No? Okay, try this one instead. Rugal is a black boy, and his white parents taught him to hate black people, but it's okay because he's an honorary white. Still feel the same way. There's no denying that Rugal is the person most harmed by this whole situation, and that blame lies ultimately at Gul Dukat's feet, but this is all far more complicated than it looks on the surface. Abuse takes many forms, and not all of them are intentional. Rugal's parents may well feel their hatred is justified, and honestly believe what they're doing is what's best for him. They may not have given a second's thought to how that will internalise, or even be aware of the concept. It's still abuse. It's still the same as indigenous children being taken to boarding schools so the civilised British can help them stop being barbarians. It's still the same as devout parents trying to pray the gay away to help their child get right with God. It's still the same as a neurodivergent kid being punished into masking so that their parents can have a normal child. The erasure of culture, the erasure of identity, the erasure of self, it's just a different type of violence. Rugal's adoptive parents are victims of the occupation. Rugal is a victim of them as a result. The former may help us understand the latter, but it doesn't excuse it. We could have a discussion about whether he'll be healthier on Bajor or Cardassia. We could have a discussion on who cares most about his future. It doesn't matter. Being the least bad option doesn't stop it being bad. Let's leave that there and move on to something else that made me think in this one, namely the conflict of interest between being a command officer and a doctor. 
Bashir spoke during the staff meeting about plain simple Garak being bitten on the hand. It's a security issue for the station, and also a patient confidentiality issue. This particular event isn't likely to be viewed as a genuine confidentiality issue, as it happened in a public place, but it raises questions about such situations in private. We've seen that elsewhere in Starfleet, with Harry Kim's little shagger escapade where he caught space crabs needing to be reported to the captain as it was both a rule violation and a potential health concern for the whole crew. The difference is that Harry Kim knew this when signing up. He agreed to his medical privacy being secondary to crew safety. Deep Space Nine has a significant civilian presence, so how does that balance change? Or does it change at all? Is this still considered a military installation? Were the people who chose to stay given consent forms to fill in, and a similar set of rules provided for all visitors? For as much as we mock the Federation's bureaucracy, it's likely they'll have this covered somewhere in their many, many regulations. We're down in the guts of how things work again, taking a single question to its extreme, and this time it makes us wonder how much paperwork would need to be in place to keep the station ticking over without a hundred unexpected complaints a week. We know inviting the Federation here to administrate was mostly because of the defensive fleet that comes with it, but a post-occupation Bajor had enough on its plate just getting its own world in order without having to think about the minutiae of interacting with hundreds of different species and the issues that brings up. It may not have been top of the list of reasons, but the Federation's experience in such matters would certainly have been a benefit when getting things running. Let's do something a little different with the sign-off for this one, shall we? Trex provided plenty of wisdom over the years, but one of the best in my opinion is given in this episode, so we'll leave you with the life experience of plain, simple Garak. I believe in coincidences. Coincidences happen every day. But I don't trust coincidences. End of episode. And it is with the most earnest honesty that I express my deepest regrets for the penis slash dental incident that occurred in the. No, that's too formal. <laughs> so, you know that time I bit your cock? No, that's too pally. This poem's to say that I was wrong when I put my teeth in your dong. Oh, this is bloody hopeless. Eight years. Yes, thank you. That's really helpful. If you want to be a use, think of something that rhymes with gusset salami. You're not writing a get well card. This needs to be convincing. All right, fine. Okay, convincing. I can do this. I can do this. Dear Nibble Dick. Eight long, lonely years. All right, all right. Woof.